Well, happy Memorial Day evening, and um, hope you had an enjoyable day, and maybe you got to go to our Memorial Day service. Um, we're, um, in these evening posts, we're taking some time to uh, talk about how we got where we came from. And um, I mentioned, I'll, I'll just hold this up, um, this chart, and again, this is something we have digitally. Um, I'm sure it could be attached to an email if it'd help you. It's, it's uh, of course, when you start talking history, it's only as good as the information you have. But um, this would help you understand where some things come came from, especially where churches came from. And I want to mention just a couple of things we talked about as far as the foundation of, because I've had people ask me, uh, there's so many different religions. How do you know which one's right? Well, it, it all starts out with this. And people will say, well, everybody's got their own interpretation of the Bible. Well, the fact is most people in most religions don't even read a Bible. Um, I've, I've talked to Buddhists. Uh, we have a very faithful lady in our church who's raised Buddhists. They have no book. The Buddhists don't have a book. They just live very good. And then they read great, great writings of different people, especially Buddha. But they have no sacred book that's inspired and um, you know, and a lot of the sacred books are, they're just ridiculous. They're filled with scientific uh, nonsense. Um, the Quran has got absolute ridiculous statements in it. Um, take out the religion, take out the morals or lack of morals. Um, take out the fact that Muhammad had all these wives and children wives and, and all the corruption uh, that he was supposed to have written the thing, but he, he was pretty, pretty sure people are pretty sure he was illiterate, couldn't read or write himself. But anyway, that's all irrelevant. But there's lots of religious books. But um, we've got a Bible. And um, so I wanted to take some time and, and just talk about where we came from. And again, I mentioned before in this chart, um, down below, if we put the time of Christ here and the time we are here, the yellow down here is the development of basically most of the Protestant religions out of Catholicism. And uh, up here would be a different group of people we've been talking about um, today they would be Baptists, but earlier they were the Lollards and the Paterians and they're just different people. Um, but they had, they had a system of belief like Jude verse three says, um, uh, contending for the faith, which was once delivered to the saints. There's a faith, the, the faith. Um, now, uh, so just reviewing quickly four things that, that basically you find scripturally in the, the new Testament and in the early church. It was an independent church. It was a church that had uh, two offices, pastor and deacon. There were no archbishops, cardinals. There were no, uh, the word father is forbidden to be used as a religious title, not as a father in your home, but as a, as a religious title. Jesus said, call no man your father. And I've showed that to Catholics and they just don't care. They just don't even care what the Bible says. It's what the church says to do, so we do it. But uh, there's there's no um, in the in the Bible church, the church that the Bible teaches, there's pastors and deacons, period. It was an independent church. It was a church with two offices, the pastor and deacon, two ordinances, uh, the Lord's Supper and baptism. And baptism was always a believer's baptism under water. In Acts chapter 8, um, the Philippian, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch is uh, talking to Philip and uh, Philip's witnessing to him. <coughs> and he says to uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch says to Philip, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest. That's the prerequisite for baptism. It has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with religious knowledge. It's do you believe Christ died for you? Are you willing to put your faith in Christ? So um, the the things that made the, the church stand out, the scriptural church is independent, two offices, pastor and deacon, two ordinances, the uh, believer's baptism and the Lord's Supper, and then fourth, it was missions-minded. You can't read far. You don't read very far in the book of Acts before they're out starting more churches and starting churches in other countries, and they're reaching out to the world. The great commission our Lord gave us was to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, um, some things that happened, and, and tonight I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, just a little bit about the, uh, the, the Reformation, and just then we'll address it off and on. But I'm going to kind of give you a quick overview, and then we'll talk about some things in the next couple of days. But um, around 300 to 500, somewhere in there, we uh, Augustine was one of the first uh, uh, early 
uh, he was in Alexandria, Egypt, and there's an awful lot of corruption came from down there. The first corrupt manuscripts of the Bible, we've talked about that um, just a little bit, but um, the, uh, uh, and maybe I'll bring a map in tomorrow night and show you these things, but but out of uh, out of there, there was a church that began to, to dominate and to control. Augustine killed hundreds and hundreds of um of the of the Donatists who were basically first century Baptists. Um, they were just people who believed what what our church would believe today, basically, and uh, but they weren't going to follow Augustine's teaching. And he had all these all these people killed, and so um, some things that, that that were different. All right, um, and again, we're looking at this this bottom group here. It started with the word Catholic means universal through military. Um, Augustine and those following him formed an alliance with the with the government. So there was a military, political, civil government that was married to the church. And that's why if you watch the old Robin Hood shows, the the king and the the priest and the cardinal and the bishop, boy, they they were they were tight and they all had control of all the peasants. And that has always been a satanic method of ruling, whether it be a king over a bunch of peasants, a king and royalty over a bunch of peasants. When our founders came to America, they came for liberty. They wanted to be able to own land. They wanted to be able to shoot a deer without getting in trouble and catch a rabbit and put it in your stew without having your life being threatened. Um, the, there was such a great divide, and, and the liberal, politically liberal people in America, they want that. It's been obvious for 40 years. I've watched it develop, and they want so much to, to they, they love a, a poorer class of people that would be dependent on the government, because once you're dependent on the government, then the government can give you more, give you less, but you are dependent on them. I don't want the government to have anything to do with us or me. Our church didn't apply for any of that um, money that uh, employers, we've got uh, 20 some employees, I could have gotten money, a um, couple of months salaries and a check. But you know what? I don't any strings attached between me and the government, between us and as a church and the government. You as a businessman, that's what it's for. And I don't think it's wrong. But as a church, we keep our church and government separate. Now, the the early, um, the we we're going to say it, the early Catholic church was married, those two. And so they get along. And you get over here, and uh, there's a time, if you can see this split that goes on right here. Um, and again, just real quickly, there was a difference of opinion. The the uh, Pope said that the king, um, the, uh, well, down later, the king of England, um, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, the king of England and the Pope got in a fuss over whether the king of England could divorce his wife. And and uh, the Pope said, no, and he said, we will too. And he said, I'll just start my own church. That's where the Church of England came from. And uh, but back here... At the at, at, because of people trying to lord over one another. Well, back there where the split happened, there was a fuss over whether Rome or Constantinople would be the head of the church, the 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 over the place where the church was based, and they fussed, and so they they finally gave up, and and we got the Greek Orthodox from Constantinople, and we get the Roman Catholic from Rome, Italy, and that's where the the, the oh, that big split here took place. Uh, that initial split that gave us two segments. And they're pretty much the same kind of a church, basically. Um, but there's some things that happened. Now, down the road, and we'll, I'm going to hurry ahead, Protestantism, um, Martin Luther and John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli, and there's others, um, a man named Savonarola. There were many people who started seeing the corruption in the Catholic Church, seeing uh, the, the, the indulgences. I can pay you money, and it'll make up for my sin. And so I'm, you know, pillaging and abusing and whatever evil things. But if I come and give the priest a couple hundred bucks and he says, you're forgiven. Uh, and it just, it's, that's an indulgence. And uh, it was a terrible thing. And a lot of atrocities taking place. So people began to rebel, Martin Luther for one. And oh, there's a lot of story behind it. But the bottom line is Luther said, I'm done with Catholicism. And he started the Lutheran church. And a while later, the Wesleys broke out of of the base in Church of England, and and uh, you can see on this thing the Presbyterians broke out, and the Methodists, and the Congregationalists, and these were here's the Catholic Church, and one by one, and I'll flip over here, and you can see 
one with the Catholic Church come along here, and one by one these churches broke off and did their own thing. Now, there's one thing they did, and this, this is the, the whole point tonight, that makes them very different from the Bible-believing top part, the Baptists at this point. And they were termed Anabaptists because they were, they were said to be re-baptizing. Because everybody got sprinkled in the Catholic Church, even those people were getting saved, they were baptizing them biblically by immersion. And so they were called Anna or rebaptizers. Well, the, the Baptists didn't believe they were rebaptizing anybody because they didn't believe that sprinkling had anything to do with baptism. It was just sprinkling a baby. Baptism is underwater for believers. But uh, besides the point, besides all that. So here's what happened. We have uh, these Luther and Zwingli and, and Calvin and these great, very brilliant men, powerful men, who broke off and started their own religions out of the Catholic Church. But they brought with them the marriage of the civil government, the military, and the church. And one of the things that Baptists have always stood for, if you have the acrostic, and I'll do it in, in a few days, B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S, -S, one of the S's is, or the, the I is individual soul liberty. Individual soul liberty. Baptists have always believed it's your decision. You decide. Baptists have never wanted to be a part of ruling a government or ruling a people. Uh, the idea in our founders that there'd be no state religion, no state sponsorship of religion. I mean, you can't have the a, a, a nativity scene on the Capitol lawn. It meant the church can't make you go to a church. The government can't make you go to a church. And so, but here's some things. The Protestant reformers, the Catholic church and the Protestant churches, they, they had the marriage of the church and the state. That was one of their distinctives. They believed that uh, and all of them believed in infant baptism. And if you didn't, all the way up into the 1600s in America, uh, when our early, early, before the founders, uh, we had founders and framers, <clears throat> before the founders of our country, the framers put together the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration and all. Before the founders, these people who came to America, pilgrims and Puritans and the Baptists and Quakers and others, um, if you didn't baptize your baby within eight days, you'd be fined, you'd be jailed, you'd be banished. The, the, and, the, and it was government authority over you. And you'd be punished. Never have people who stood with this book, never have Bible-believing people tried to lord over people. They've never persecuted other people. They've never said, if you're not like us, we're chopping your head off. They, I mean, how many people come to a Bible-believing church and leave and and it um, happens all the time. And it, and it happened all the time. Um, you don't believe it, go somewhere else. And uh, nobody ever wanted to be over you. So, so some of the, it's like when they left the Catholic Church, they brought some baggage with them. The marriage of the church and the state, the military, and the law enforcement, also under the authority of the church. So you had to do what you were supposed to do. I mean, you go back to the Reformation era. They would go to your home once a year and inspect how many clothes you have. You had too many clothes, they'd fine you or take the clothes. If you had too many dishes, a family of four, what do you have five plates for? And this is these are Protestant churches. This is Calvin and Zwingli and Luther and these men. Um, so they brought out this oversight. Then they brought infant baptism with them. <clears throat> and then, um, and of course, that's nowhere in the Bible did any baby ever get baptized. And then another thing they brought with them out of the Catholic Church was their hierarchy. Cardinals, bishops, archbishops, uh, popes, uh, the father, the rector, all these different people. <clears throat> and the, the Protestant churches brought with them a hierarchy um, until, I don't know if it is still, but until I know it was 20, 30 years ago, if you were a Methodist pastor, the Methodist denomination would move the Methodist pastors wherever. And they, they just tell you, you're moving from Southern California to Philadelphia and you have no choice. Either leave the ministry or go where they told you. There was uh, an oversight that overruled over other people. And they ruled other people and they ruled the churches. And the churches had no say in that. Now that's not Bible at all. This book, uh, you read about the church in this book and you'll find that each church is independent. They did what they felt the believers in that church wanted to do. And uh, there was no bosses. And even today, but but not just today, historically, in the, in the Baptist church of Somebody didn't like it. They didn't do it. The Apostle John in the, in the little epistle, Second John, John writes a letter saying, I wanted to come to your church, but such and such, and he names the guy, um, forbid us from coming. And um, you know what? Here's the Apostle John. I guess that's a big shot. 
and he's wanting to come to visit this church and a member or whoever in that church says, we don't want you here. So he doesn't come. You see, each church was an independent church. And in the church, uh, at our church, our church can fire me any anytime they want. I mean, if we can have a church meeting together, we have to have a, a church business meeting. Our church can vote me out anytime they want to um, bring it to a men's meeting, bring it to the church floor, vote, and I'm gone and bring in another guy, bring in a young guy. Um, so, but there's no hierarchy in Bible believing people. There's a pastor, the two offices, pastor and deacons, and the deacons weren't over the pastor. The pastor was the shepherd. He's the teacher, he's the preacher, he's the overseer, but he has no authority. I can't make anybody do anything. I can't stop anybody from doing anything. Um, of course, in America now, we have, a, we have a church constitution because we're incorporated, and there are things that uh, we need to run in a certain business-like manner because we are under a, a government of laws. But um, And then another thing, so the, the Protestants brought out from Catholicism a state church, a state church marriage. They brought law enforcement and the police tied to the religious groups. They brought infant baptism. They brought a hierarchy of bosses over bosses over bosses. And then lastly, they brought formal services, formal worship, stained glass, chanting choirs, uh, sober, you know, big print, be still and know that I'm God. And, and you come to church, you sit quiet, you listen to a guy and speaking in Latin, you got no idea what he's saying, but you're just going to be there with your head bowed and be humble and hope somehow God's happy with you. You know, Baptists have always been known as people who are happy, who talked a lot, who shouted in church, who said amen. Uh, all the way back to the first book of First Corinthians, uh, chapter 14, he says, um, if they, if you're not all speaking the same language, how could a guy say amen at, at your preaching? Um, that's Bible. Bible churches were, they weren't sober. They were happy and bright and exciting. And historically, you go back, uh, Baptists have been criticized for being too loud, singing too loud, singing too happy, too much smiling. And, uh, but so this, this division here, it is a philosophical division. This, the red up here, this is a group of Bible believing people. And though they had a group of a lot of different names, they were never Protestants. They did not come out of the Catholic Church down here. Uh, we were we were never affiliated with Catholicism. We didn't come out of Lutheranism. We didn't come out of a Methodist or Presbyterian or Congregational Church. The Baptists have been traced all the way back to the first century with various names. But these things we're talking about, and um, and again, there are a lot of great Christians in Protestant churches, but they all had this baggage that they got out of Catholicism. And so, anyway, a few thoughts on Memorial Day. I should have made it be a, a, a remember the military, but we did that this morning. But uh, just trying to help us know who we are. We are not Protestants. We're Baptists. And um, and we're, we're a whole different breed. Everything about us different. And the most important thing is it's got to be in this. This is how we do what we do because it's the book. God bless you. Have a great week. Let's pray for a good week that God would bless richly uh, the country, the decisions being made. Oh, we need God. We need his help. Have a great night. Welcome back to our Soul Winning Hints. And uh, we're going to pick up where we left off on just going through what we call the Romans Road. Now, I've led people to Christ from the Old Testament. I've led people to Christ from the book of Matthew. And uh, there's all kinds of ways, because what gets people saved is faith. When they put their faith in Christ, not their church, not their own good works, you don't get saved by praying a prayer. The, the, you get saved by trusting what Jesus did for you. And, uh, and that's why it's awkward. It's not a do your first communion or do your catechism. It's when a person realizes Christ is offering me something and I want it. I'm willing to accept it. There is a time, there's a place, there's a moment when you're, when you're saved. There's a time in your world, your history, when you were lost and now you're saved. And I'll get to that today. So um, th this is just a real simple way, staying in one book of the Bible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up where we, we left off at Romans 5.8. And so I'm going to pick up there with a quick review. So now I'm back at the door. I'm a, with a guy at work. And I'm talking with you. You're my person I'm witnessing to, and I'm not getting a response from you. But uh, I'm going to start with a quick review. And I may put a couple parentheses in to explain. But let's just start there at Romans 5.8. So just several things we've said so far. Uh, first of all, and I'm going to show you these just real quick to remember. Um, we started out, these things have I written unto you that believe, not that you that go to church or you be good, but believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know 
that ye have eternal life. So this key here is that you may know an absolute assurance. Now, the believe we'll talk about later, but of course, believing, the devil believes in God and believes it's, there's, it's putting your faith in it. So we went from there. And again, I have my New Testament mark, page 219, or to Romans 310. And so we're going to go over to the book of Romans. And um, now I'm back talking to my friend that needs to get saved. So first of all, you can know. Secondly, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. So none of us are righteous. We, of course, all have sinned. We go over here to verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let me just take a moment and explain something. These verses, I've been using these verses, reading these verses for 45 years. And one of the dangers of familiarity is you say it really fast. You know, the wage of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And they're thinking, what did he say? So I try to read, I like pointing at the verse, I like reading it slowly, because these are whole, these are brand new concepts. And uh, so take your time. If God's work, it's God who saves them, not you. It's our, we're just the messenger, so take your time, go slow. So I'm back over here. So on number one, we decided we can know. Number two, we've all sinned. And then we went over here to Romans chapter six, and it says the wages of sin is death. That's what I deserve. I deserve to die and go to hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's a free gift available. Now, how do I get that gift? And we've already gone here, and this is just quick review. But the but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the key is that Christ died in my place, died for me. So I deserve to die. I deserve to die and go to hell. Christ did not deserve any punishment. He was perfect and holy and righteous. And I don't want to go to hell, and I don't want to have to die for my sins. And Jesus already did die for my sins, so I simply have to make the decision of trusting him. Now, the question I had when I was a child, I heard something about this in church. I was maybe third grade. Only a few times I went to church, but I remember a teacher saying, Jesus died for everybody. He died for the murderers. He died for the boys and girls. And I remember thinking, if he died for everybody, who's not going to hell? If he died for everybody, then is everybody going to heaven? Now, as a little child, I didn't grow up in church. I never read a Bible. I wasn't going to raise my hand and ask a question, but I remember still the classroom. I can tell you what the teacher looked like and the chalkboard behind her. And I wondered, Who's going to heaven? You know, you might think like you get a 70%, it's a C in school, and 80% it's a B, and a 90 it's an A. And but but what gets me into heaven? Does my good have to outweigh my bad? Well, we already decided we're all sinners. We already decided the wages of sin is death. So whatever sin I sin, that's gonna cost me from I won't go to heaven, I will go to hell. Let's look at what it is that makes the final difference over in the book of Romans, chapter 10. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, it doesn't say you might be saved. It says you shall be saved. It's an absolute. You with your mouth uh, confess or call on him. You believe in your heart. Let's look at the next verse, and it'll get more clear in the next couple of verses. For with the heart man believeth, unto righteousness. When you put righteous, you put your faith in Christ, you become righteous before God. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, not confession to a man, not to me. I'm, I don't deserve anybody confessing to me. Let's look at, at a verse in just two verses down, Romans 10, 13. He summarizes it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, let's look at that word, word whosoever. So, Let's put my name in there, for if Bruce, and let's put your name, Bill. For if Bruce or Bill shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be, what does it say there, Bill? And Bill says to me, saved. Now, if I have my finger on the word and Bill doesn't say it, I'm going to say it because maybe Bill can't read and I don't want to embarrass him. So whosoever, so if Bill or Bruce shall call on the name of the Lord, they shall be, what does it say there, Bill? It says we're going to be saved, right? Yes, so saved. So all that we need to do is to call on him. I could show you if you wanted to look at it. I don't want to take any more of your time, but 
on the cross, Jesus had a thief on both sides of him. Uh, they were called murderers and thieves. And one of them made fun of Jesus. And the other turned to Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And the simple, he, he early, he, he admitted to his friend, he said, you're making fun of him. We deserve to be here. This man's done nothing wrong. And that thief just called out for salvation. And what we just read is whosoever you or me would call on the Lord, we shall be saved. So I want to ask you a question, Bill. Is there any, re first of all, do you believe Christ died for you? And he would say yes, if he did. Do you believe that he rose from the dead? Do you believe that you're a sinner in need of a savior? All right. Now, Bill, is there any reason why you wouldn't want him to save you? We just read if you'd call on him, he'd save you. Do you believe those things in your heart? Now, if he says no, I'm going to go back over it again. I'm going to go another direction. But by the time I get this far, usually they do. So, Bill, do you believe these things? Do you believe in your heart that he died for you, that he rose from the dead, and that you're a sinner in need of a Savior? Okay, well, if you do, then all that's left is for you to receive the gift of eternal life. And if you'd be willing to simply call on him and ask him, he'd save you. Now, I'm going to stop for a minute and talk about uh, how I conclude and you've heard a couple of people, Brother Coral talked about it, Brother Mark, one of us talked about what do you do at the end of presenting the gospel. Because here's the problem. If right here uh, I say to Bill, so Bill, you understand Jesus will save you. Yeah, I do. And I say, all right, Bill, God bless you. And I leave, he's not saved. Because there, there is a point in time. I once was lost and now I'm found. I once was on my way to hell, now I'm on my way to heaven. So I'm going to, now by now, maybe in his heart, he's already trusted Christ, but he doesn't, he doesn't have it locked down. I don't have it locked down. It's really good. It's like your birth certificate. You need to know when you were born. And so I want a time and place. Scripturally, Jesus said, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. It could be you're in church and you walk down an aisle. And again, I'm not talking to Bill, the, the lost guy. I'm talking to you, the person learning about soul winning. But the preacher preaches a sermon, explains the gospel, and he says, if you want to get saved, step out of your seat and come forward. Probably the moment I step out of my seat, probably at that moment, I'm putting my faith in Christ. But I don't realize it. It's not really locked in. I don't, I don't have a lot of mental uh, glue scripture to tie to my heart. So it's nice at the altar to have someone show the verses, look at it, pray together, lock down the time. So it's very important to me that there's a time and place in a city park when I bowed my head and trusted Christ. So I'm going to get Bill to pray with me here, okay? So back to you. You're Bill, the lost guy I'm witnessing to. So Bill, is there any reason you wouldn't want Jesus to save you? And Bill says, no, there's not. All right, well, Bill, let me do this. I'd just like to have a word of prayer with you before I go. And so I'm going to just go through this just like I would if I was talking to somebody. So, and I'm going to bow my head. You don't have to bow your head. I'm going to bow my head. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do everything just like I would. I may hurry it a little bit for the sake of time. But Bill, let me pray for you first. All right. God bless Bill. Thank you for him. And we had a great conversation. And I'm grateful for his open heart towards spiritual things. Bless his marriage, his kids, and his work. And I thank you for getting a few minutes with him. Now, Bill, if you'd like to trust Christ as Savior, if you'd like to call on him, Bill, I invite you to just pray and just pray right along with me a simple prayer of faith. It's not the words that save you, it's your heart. But if you would just with you, and by the way, right now while I'm doing this, his head's probably up looking at me, but I'm just looking down. I'm, I got my eyes closed because we're going to pray. And so, Bill, um, if you would just, you just simply um, pray with me, uh, it just it, it, simply as you know how right now, dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Now, at that point, I can expect a delay because he's thinking, man, I mean, does he want me to pray out loud? What does he want me to do? And he might still be looking at me. Then what happens? I've seen him do it. All of a sudden, their head bows. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. If, if, uh, and then let me just go through it. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I'll wait for him to reply. And then I, um, I believe you died for me. And I believe you rose from the dead. And each phrase, I'm waiting for him to repeat. I believe you rose from the dead. And I'm asking you to save me. And the best way I know how I'm trusting you to save me and to give me eternal life. Amen. Now, Bill, I just heard you pray that prayer. Now, as far as I know, you were as sincere as you could be. Let's look at the scripture again just once more, Bill. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Did you just call on the name of the Lord, Bill? You did, all right. 
It says you shall be what, Bill? Saved. Now, as far as I know, unless God's a liar, he saved you. Now, you may not feel saved, but the fact is you could be saved. Now, for you that are with Mark Bibles, um, here I've got Acts 2.41. And so that's where I'm going to go in a minute. So, Bill, um, what you just now did is what people have been doing for 2,000 years. And it doesn't even really take words because a person who's deaf could hear the God. I mean, a person who's deaf could read the gospel and they could trust Christ in their heart and out of their heart. For the We just read a minute ago, for the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So, but this is the moment right now. And so um, right now, Bill, if you were to die right now, we walk, I walk away, you walk away, you get hit by a truck and you drop dead. According to this, where would you go when you die, Bill? And if he says, I don't know, I'm going to go all the way back and start over again. But rarely does that happen. Uh, if you take your time, usually they, they'll say, well, I'd, I'd go to heaven. I say, all right, Bill, if you were to die right now, where would you go? Well, you'd go to heaven. Wonderful. And you know, the reason you go to heaven is because we read right here in Romans 10 that you trusted Christ. You called on him. You put your faith in him. Now, obviously, like me, I grew up with a Lutheran family. We believed in God, heaven, hell, the Bible. We never read the Bible, but, but I had faith. But there was a time on August 28th, 1975, when I put my faith in Christ. I trusted him. So right now today, Bill, here we are on May 22nd, and it's at 11 o'clock in the morning. And you trusted Christ. So right here today, God saved you. Now, Bill, let me ask you, if you'd have died an hour ago, where would you have gone? Now, usually at this point, it gets quiet because they're trying to think, oh man, I'm really not all that bad. And as soon as they're thinking I'm not all that bad, they're thinking good works. Well, works don't save them. It's faith that saves them. So Bill's sitting there thinking, I said, you know, if right here's when you got saved, then five minutes ago, you were lost. If, if the, the moment I got saved, 10 o'clock at night, Bill, had I died at 9 o'clock that same night, I'd have gone to hell. Not because I was bad. I'd have gone to hell because I had not yet trusted Christ. See, you're not getting to heaven because you're good. You're not going to hell because you're bad. You're getting to heaven because you've trusted Jesus and put your faith in him. And we would have gone to hell because we were trusting our church or our good works or our prayers or whatever it might be. But it's not prayers that save us or send us to hell. It's not being good that saves us or gets us to heaven. It's Jesus that saves us. Let me show you one more verse, and then I better go, Bill, because I know you've got things to do, and I do. Over here in Acts chapter 2, and I just want to show you one verse here. and Get my glasses on so I'm a little bit... Um, most of these verses I can just quote, but I don't want to mess things up. Look here, it says in Acts 2.41... Then they that gladly received his word. Let me ask you, did you just gladly receive God's word, Bill? All right. It says, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, Bill, what was going on this day is they were preaching, they were preaching all over the town of Jerusalem, and people were getting saved, and um, Jesus had been gone now a, a, a while, a few weeks uh, he'd been crucified 40 days ago, and, and he just ascended about 10 days ago. And boy, these, uh, the apostles were preaching, and people were getting saved. And baptism shows, baptism is like my wedding ring. Baptism doesn't make anybody saved. My wedding ring doesn't make me married. I could take it off. I'm still married. I'd give it to you if you were single. It wouldn't make you married. This just shows. It's a symbol. And so baptism says the one who hung on the cross, and he was buried and he rose from the dead, that person, I'm trusting in him. And so I am choosing to be buried underwater and raised again. And so for me, Bill, I was sprinkled in the Lutheran church as a baby, but there's nobody sprinkled in the Bible and there's no babies baptized in the Bible. Baptism is always for believers. Now I realize we're sitting here, we're at your front door or we're at the lunchroom at work and we're not gonna get you know, nowhere to get baptized. But Bill, I just want you to understand, just like had you told your wife, that you at the wedding altar, that you didn't want to put a wedding ring on, that might bother her. And Jesus wants us to make our public statement. And this thing of baptism, getting underwater with the, uh, with, with the buried like Jesus was and raising again, it's symbolic to all the church or the people who are around. I got, I got baptized in a stream up in the mountains. 
there were about 20 people there, 30 people there, wasn't it church? So there comes a point when you have, well, you may down the road, you'll have a chance to get baptized. And when that chance comes, I hope you're not ashamed of Jesus and that you'll take that chance. All right. God bless you, Bill. And I'll, I'll come back and we'll talk again. So back to you as folks are just watching this. Um, we'll add more to this in the next couple of nights, but this gets us through the basic Romans road. All right. Great. God bless you. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.